The Spin Off Podcast Network. Love news, but find keeping up a bit overwhelming? Well, Newsable is the answer. It's your daily fix of everything worth talking about. I'm your host, Imogen Wells, and in about 15 minutes, I'll bring you what you need to know from Aotearoa and around the world and explain why it matters. Newsable tackles the big stuff without taking itself too seriously. Listen and follow wherever you get your podcasts. When the Facts Change is brought to you by the Spin Off Podcast Network in partnership with Kiwi Bank. The bank for Kiwi looking to get ahead in business and in life. A bank that delivers expertise in banking know how, smart advice for business owners wanting to invest, grow their business, or diversify. A bank that adapts with technology through the lens of its people and customers. It is a bank with heart that is driven by its purpose. Kiwi making Kiwi better off. I want to tell you about a time that I felt really uncomfortable and out of my depth. I just moved to Singapore. I was on one of these expat packages, you know, where the company you work for pays for the apartment and the car and you get a salary and you get to save the whole thing and it's all very well laid out for you. It was, on the face of it, a real treat, a real luxury. And so we moved into this apartment in Singapore and then suddenly discovered something that made us feel really uncomfortable. The apartment came with a servant. Now, this is not something we were used to as New Zealanders. We thought everyone was the same as everyone else, and you made your own dinner and cleaned your own toilet, and having someone attached to the house who was a servant just didn't seem right. Now, this person, her name was Celeste. She came from the Philippines and she was living in a very small room next to the the kitchen. This is something that a lot of apartments in Singapore had, a servant, often from the Philippines or from Indonesia. And um, it was an accepted thing. In fact, when we initially thought, well, we we don't need a servant. We can make our own dinner and clean our own toilets. Uh, Turned out if we'd said no, um, she would have been sent back to the Philippines. Um, No rights of residency, essentially uh, treated really poorly. So we realised that we had to um, make sure that she was okay because all of the money she earned, Celeste earned, went back to her family and they depended on her earning money in Singapore to send back to the Philippines. And this is a story that is um, seen all around the world now. Uh, Philippines has one of the highest proportions of people working as guest workers in other countries, including New Zealand. Um, when this happened uh, for us back in 2003, there weren't that many people from the Philippines working in, in New Zealand. But since the Christchurch earthquake and huge demand from dairy farms for workers from the Philippines, you've seen a significant increase in migration from the Philippines. And when I say migration, I mean temporary migration. So a lot of the workers who are here are actually working on rolled contracts, rolled working visas. They don't have the same rights, they don't have the same security, and they don't have the same connections to the country, even though they're working with us. The story of Celeste struck me as something that was deeply un-New Zealand. I felt that it didn't really reflect who I was. And I was sort of embarrassed when I talked to friends and family back at home about the person who was in our house and used to help us make dinner and do a lot of the work around the house. In fact, we, we did quite a bit of the cooking for her in the end. Uh, and she was a lovely person and helped um, help raise our children. And um, we, we made sure that when we finished uh, and moved on from Singapore that um, she was protected and that the next group of people in the house um, looked after her and did the right thing. But it really didn't feel right. It didn't feel like a New Zealand thing to do. And back in 2003, it really wasn't. We didn't have enormous numbers of guest workers, but that's changed. Over the last 10 years, we've had stunning population growth, in large part because of the growth of people here on temporary work visas. Skilled work visas, essential work visas, often as students with work rights or backpackers with work rights. And just before the lockdown, it had a total of almost 400,000 people. Now, this is unplanned for, accidentally on purpose migration, which of course came without 
the infrastructure spending. Unlike uh, Kevin Costner in the Field of Dreams who said, build it and they will come, we just said, they've came, oh, maybe we should build something. <laughs> and that's part of the problem we have in New Zealand, real problems with congestion, obviously around our transport systems, focus mostly on Auckland, uh, restrictions on our housing supply, along with plenty of demand for housing has helped increase rents. And of course, we know about house prices, although there's other things moving there as well. The reason I bring this up is because right now the government's doing a review of our migration settings. We've done a previous podcast on this, but it struck me in this week when we're again using the framing of New Zealand, Aotearoa, as a team of five million, but we're not really that. And when we do this planning for our migration settings, should we also be thinking about our population policy? Do we have one? Turns out we don't, actually. We've had a bipartisan convention, if you like, that we would grant upwards of 100,000 residencies every couple of years. We haven't actually met that target very often, but on the side, without a plan and without too much consensus, although uh, actually National and Labor have done very similar things over the last decade, you've seen an explosion in the growth of temporary workers. Huge demand from employers, of course, for people who are able to hit the ground running and start working and perhaps don't need the training, who are really motivated to send that money home and do the job and turn up on time and, and are working hard, in many cases, harder than perhaps they should under the law. Uh, you have significant migrant abuse and problems with people working for less than the minimum wage, certainly after uh, you calculate how much they're paid compared with how much they work. This week in When the Facts Change, I talked to some people who studied temporary migration, looked at the social impacts looked at whether we should have a population policy, and then also talked to some people who are closely focused on whether we have the right level of infrastructure for the population we have. Because ultimately, when you think about population policy and whether you're matching your population growth with your infrastructure plans, you're not just asking a technical question. You're actually asking a question about who you are who you think you are, whether you think you have a classless society, whether you've created, accidentally on purpose, a group of people who live in your society but aren't actually part of it. Now, it's a unique moment, particularly now during lockdown, where we actually have some breathing space to make these decisions about the future. The problem is the government is not interested in doing a population policy. The words population control and population policy are catnip for those who want to argue that, in a bad faith way, I think, that this is all about some attempt to restrict migration or control the ethnic makeup of the population or a way to discriminate against people who are coming into New Zealand. Um, I don't think that's the case, mainly because in the last decade or two, we've made an awful error which was we have not built the infrastructure, the housing, the roads, the schools, the hospitals for our fast-growing population. And we have created a group of people who are, in effect, second-class citizens. That's not fair on them. And it actually changes the nature of who we are as New Zealanders. It made me uncomfortable in Singapore when I realised that we had a servant, someone who didn't have the same rights as us, who at the whim of an official could be sent home. We got to know Celeste quite well. We learned who her family was and how much money she was sending home and we made sure we put a bit extra in. We also learned she had a boyfriend. The trouble was this is not something you were allowed to have as a maid from the Philippines in Singapore. The moment you got pregnant or wanted to get married to someone else, suddenly you were kicked out of the country. And it was quite sobering to see someone who was very cautious about declaring who their relationships were with because they feared getting kicked out of the country. They weren't solid in their place on the, on the land. That's this week on When the Facts Change. How big do we want to be? 
how fast do we want to grow, who's going to pay for it, and more importantly, what do we want our society to be? Do we want it to be equal or do we want to have a landed gentry and a bunch of servants? I hope we don't go down the servant track. I'm Bernard Hickey. That's this week on When the Facts Change, a podcast on the spin-off podcast network brought to you in partnership with Kiwi Bank. Well, welcome to When the Facts Change, Professor Paul Spoonley, who is the author of The New New Zealand Facing Demographic Disruption, which, Paul, I understand you're putting out a fresh edition for the latest dramas. Yes, one of the difficulties we have, Bernard, is that population and the components of it change constantly. And so COVID has meant one of those very significant and very disruptive changes yet again. So it's trying to capture some of that, but I'm sure I've not captured all of the implications of COVID for us. The book argues that we need a population policy. Why is that? Well, for for a couple of reasons. One is to anticipate what our population will look like in five 10, 15 or 20 years so that we can plan for it. We're not very good at that. And I think it's great that we've now got a productivity commission, which is charged with looking at our um, immigration over 30 years. And we've got an infrastructure commission, which is charged with looking at infrastructure over 30 years. Uh, The difficulty, of course, is that we've got both local and national governments, which uh, tend to operate in three-year cycles And that gets very frustrating. You know what the country's going to look like over a five or ten year period, and yet we don't plan for that. We don't anticipate that. We don't think what we could do better or different in that space. Because for the last decade or so, we've had population growth that has been faster than the official forecasts from 10, 20 years ago. It also was faster than our peers. In a recent presentation, you make the point that uh, we had new migration, 35,000 or so between 2006 and 2013, but in the following six years, it ramped up to 400,000, and that our growth rate from migration of over 11 is almost double that of Australia and uh, five or six times greater than the UK and the US. So how did we get into this position where we got a lot more migration than we plan for. Well, two-thirds of our population growth over the last seven years has come from net migration gains. So if we, if we go back to 2012, which was a rather disastrous year for our population, we saw huge numbers go overseas and 54,000 left for Australia uh, to live permanently in Australia in that one year alone. Our, our natural increase was about 32,000 but we saw a net loss of about 3,000. And then we flipped that around completely by 2020, where natural increase, which is the difference between um, births and deaths, was about 26,000, but we got a a net gain from migration of 85,000. So that 85,000 is historically, for New Zealand, extremely high, very different from what we've seen in the past. And it's higher than comparative countries like Canada and Australia. So we've just had this huge surge in population which has been driven by a net migration gain. Was this something that um, everyone expected or wanted to happen or was it sort of accidentally on purpose? I think it was accidentally on purpose. I mean, for many years, the national government, um, net migration gains drove a lot of our uh, economic headline growth figures And really, it contributed significantly to our economic activity, although not our productivity. And so I I think the government is right to ask the Productivity Commission whether or not the both permanent and temporary migrants have been a disincentive to investing in productivity gains. And so we've got to this point by 2020 and covid Um, that we'd become very reliant on the net migration gains and about 300,000 people here on temporary work and study visas, which is an extraordinarily high number. And it created a a new group of people who, quite a large group, that maybe don't have the same rights as everyone else and maybe don't have the same expectations or commitment 
uh, or connection to the place that um, most of the population have. What's the implications of having a lot more temporary work visa people rather than people here going into permanent residency or plain old um, you know, migrants coming from overseas? I think there are a number of consequences. They're never really accounted for in terms of the way in which we govern and understand this country. So, so there's this big movement onshore, typically around when we enrol for our universities or when we need to pick apples, and they contribute to our labour market, but we don't consider them as part of the the permanent population, and therefore we don't plan for that. And I think that's caused a number of discrepancies, and it certainly helps explain some of the uh, problems we've encountered over recent years in terms of infrastructure. And for the last sort of uh, 20 or 30 years that I could see, there's been a bipartisan agreement or acknowledgement that we're probably going to have, you know, 80 to 100,000 people get new residency every couple of years. What do you think is the right number? What should we be planning for every couple of years in, in the future? Well, I'd love us to take a step back, Bernard, and say, what do we want in terms of our population? So we've talked about growth, but we also need to talk about the dispersal or the geographical spread of our population. So if you look at the Infrastructure Commission's planning, it anticipates 50% of all population growth over the next three decades will occur in Auckland. And then we need to add in Hamilton and Tauranga. And what we see is this movement to the top half of the North Island of our population base. Uh, Christchurch is an exception, and we probably ought to talk about Queenstown Lakes as being a rather odd um, sort of subsystem within our national system. So what we need to do is talk about the components, which are births, deaths, regional population profiles and, and growth, and then, of course, migration. And we need to put that all together and understand what's happening. And, and we don't, for example, discuss what declining fertility means. So we've gone from replacement level in 2014 at 2.1 births per woman to 1.6. And I fully anticipate it will go to 1.5 this year, given the um, impacts of COVID. And at 1.5, we enter a very select group of countries which are called low, low fertility countries. Whatever it is in those four components, we don't put them together and understand what's happening. And so I've just had a, a look at the uh, long-term plans, which all councils are required to produce at the moment, uh, which go from 21 to 31. And all of them anticipate that the growth they've experienced in the last five years will continue, and it won't. I mean, first of all, migration is not contributing in the way it has. Secondly, we've got ongoing decline in our fertility. Thirdly, we've got this very large population which is beginning to exit the workforce as baby boomers you know, enter their 60s and 70s. So all of that contributes to, for example, in some areas, a contraction and sometimes a major contraction in our workforce in those areas. And, and we, don't, we don't put all the elements together and think, what is it that is happening, but also what is it that we want to happen? There are some who say you can't really plan our population because you can't control New Zealanders either coming home or leaving to go overseas. Um, what's your view on that? No, the, the, the inflow and outflow of New Zealanders and Australians, by the way, who tend to be treated in the same way in our migration system, is something that can't be easily controlled. So when we go back to 2012, we saw that major exodus of New Zealanders leaving for other countries. By the way, there's a bit of a media myth that's uh, going around at the moment and that somehow we're seeing a, a flood of New Zealanders coming back. In fact, if you look at the pre-COVID year and then look at 2020, there's been a drop of New Zealanders returning to this country of almost 50%. So what's happening is that fewer New Zealanders are leaving. And so we've got a net gain of New Zealanders at the moment simply because some are arriving, but many more are staying here. And that's something that is very difficult to control. The second thing that's difficult to control is to think about 
what we might do in terms of encouraging migrants in particular, but perhaps others, to move to regional areas. In Canada, they have what's called a provincial nominee program in which regions work alongside the government and actually select and recruit migrants themselves. We don't really see that. What we've got is a national migration policy, which almost exclusively benefits Auckland and very few other parts of New Zealand. Now, the government's uh, reviewing its migration settings and the Productivity Commission is having a look at the uh, impacts of migration. Uh, Do you think you can actually do it properly if you don't have an overarching population policy as well? No, no, I don't. So, I mean, for many years, I would argue that the bulk of our population policy is really our migration policy. They tend to be one and the same. And uh, if we go back to um, 2020, for example, we had population growth of 2.2%, which is incredibly high, by the way, in terms of high-income countries. It's hovering now at 0.6%, which is probably too low. So the the bulk of our population growth now comes from natural increase, and we've got no migrants to speak of. What I would argue is that we, we probably need to settle on a notional figure, which Canada and Australia do, which is that your net migration gain ought to be about 1% of your population. So that would be a a net migration gain of 50,000. We have natural increase of around 27, 28,000. That would produce population growth of around 1.5%. But if we go back to some of your questions, that still leaves out the New Zealanders and Australians who, who churn through the system and who we can't control. And it also um, leaves out things like um, dispersal of the population that's, that's coming on board. And just finally, what sense are you getting from discussions with various local and central government leaders about whether they want some sort of population policy? The first thing to say, Bernard, is when I look at those long-term plans, I think they've undercooked their population assumptions so there's, there's often very little on which they will base those assumptions. So most of them are assuming ongoing population growth at this particular point. I think the second thing is that when we wrote that book, Rebooting the Regions, we did talk to local authorities around the country and we did say to them that through the 2020s, there are going to be significant shifts in your population. It's going to age very often. Many of your local taxpayers, ratepayers, are going to be on fixed incomes. Your fertility is going to drop. You're going to lose quite a few workers because they're going to either exit the workforce locally because they retire or because they migrate either overseas or to our major centres. So what are you going to do to think about that? And when we began to talk about migration, you know, local authorities divide up into two very clear camps. One has welcomed them, and I talk about towns like Ashburton, but in other areas, they're very reluctant to see migrants as a as a useful addition to the local community, much less the, the, the labour force. To, to summarise, I, I get very frustrated because I think that we don't look at the evidence and we're not good at forecasting and therefore there's a big gap between what actually happens in terms of the population of a local or a national community and, and what we do in terms of providing for that. And I think that's that's one of our major challenges. I mean, I would just finish by noting that we reached our latest million population largely because of this big surge in migration many years earlier than most were, were forecasting. And I think we run that risk yet again by not considering all these factors that are in play and then beginning to think about how what we want. I mean, we can change some of them. So what are the policy settings that will, will benefit us and our communities? The political economy, it's a funny old place. Thank you very much to Professor Paul Spoonley, who has written a book and updated it on the new New Zealand facing demographic disruption. Paul Spoonley, thank you very much. You've been on When the Facts Change on the Spinoff Podcast Network. Thank you, Bernard. 
Oh, kia ora, and welcome to Professor Tahu Kukutai, who is a demographer at Waikato University and leads the Māori and Indigenous Futures Programme within the university's National Institute of Demographic and Economic Analysis. Thank you very much. Welcome to When the Facts Change. Kia ora, Bernard. I'm trying to understand whether New Zealand should have some sort of planning range or policy for the size of our population. What do you think? Well, uh, let's just do a bit of 101 demography. So there's kind of two ways that a population can grow, right? Net migration or natural increase. And so governments uh, all over the world, well, actually mainly in Europe and other sort of colonial settler states, have tried to figure out how can we increase fertility so that we can increase natural increase so we can grow our population at home. They failed miserably. Fertility everywhere in the world is on a downward uh, trajectory, so there's not a lot you can do to manipulate the natural increase driver of population change. So really what that leaves us with is net migration. So I guess now people are asking the question, should we have a net migration limit? Should we fix on a target so that we can control our population growth? And that somehow that will mean that we're better prepared for population growth and can plan for it and have a sort of a more equitable approach. I think no. I think our planning approach needs to have a much stronger population lens because most of our sort of the interface between population and policy is hugely important and for the most part policy makers and politicians have not had a population lens or any real appreciation of demography um, when when setting about making sort of policy changes or developing policy and I mean migration is a classic example with sort of been relying on on sort of um, you know net migration as a as a as a fix it and now we've had a global pandemic um, migration has you know, has has come to uh, a, a bit of a trickle, and and it's sort of a what next? Should we have a population policy? Should we sort of belatedly come to the party and develop a population lens? My answer to that is yes, but fixating on a specific number is not the answer. So you know we have a whole bunch of people who are building infrastructure thinking about um, how many schools or hospitals should be in places and where they should be. Uh, what should that lens look like? Because my impression from the last 30 years is that there were official forecasts from Stats NZ, often that looked backwards and basically took some sort of average and said it's going to be something like this. And then 30 years on, we have uh, had quite strong population growth relative to the rest of the world and relative to our long-term history. What do you think that lens should be? Yeah, well, look, here's the thing. Migration is so volatile, you know, even if we take the pandemic out of the equation. So, you know, was it last year we got to our fifth million and it was like, yay, we met this sort of arbitrary mark and do we celebrate? <laughs> you know, for some reason it was some sort of cause for celebration, like, yes, there's enough of us to reach five million. But, you know, in the 17 years that it took to add that extra million, you know, migration varied from a low of 16,000 in 2011 to a high of just under 91,000 in 2016. So that just gives you a sense of the huge sort of volatility that we have in migration, and that's kind of driven by a range of sort of global forces. So why I say no, let's not fixate on a number, is because I actually think it's more important to have an understanding of population composition. So here in Aotearoa, we have, you know, two populations, well, we have multiple populations now, but historically there have been European population and the Māori population. They've gone through the demographic demographic transitions at completely different stages, and that means we have completely different, and side by side, two populations with completely different demographic histories and very different population structures. So the, you know, the median age for the Māori population is about 24 years. For the Pākehā population, it's over 40 and these, these are two populations sitting side by side. And so when you think about the importance of age structure for education, for retirement, for fertility, for mortality, you've got this completely, you know, you've got some overlap, but very different needs as a consequence of these different age structures. And so sort of fixating on this number without actually appreciating the very um, nuanced and complex sort of population dynamics that sort of in many ways defines Aotearoa in ways that we don't really see in other countries, 
is hugely important, but most policymakers have been quite blind to it. The other thing, of course, is that we have sort of regional, what we call it, divergence. So, you know, population growth is hugely uneven across Aotearoa. So if you have a sort of a one-size-fits-all to sort of population planning and fixating on a particular number, that's not, you know, that's going to look really different depending on which part of the country you're in. Some regions have undergone population decline. Some regions have had sort of like really sort of supercharged population growth. You know, the ethnic composition of Aotearoa varies dramatically depending where on the mutu you are. There's just so many aspects of population composition which are currently not taken into account that my feeling is that fixating on numbers is actually sort of a secondary. Yes, of course, it's important. But to me, it's sort of a secondary concern as opposed to composition. And, of course, an important part of composition is our growing levels of inequality. Yeah, that's an interesting point. You you mentioned that planners have not taken into account the differences in the populations, particularly the the younger median age for Māori, and and that may have um, been a factor in not enough schools, not enough hospitals, not enough paediatric ICU beds, those sorts of things. Can you give us an idea of how the failures to understand those nuances has expressed itself in the various policy choices we've made? Oh, look, one, I guess one area that we've, um, and actually my previous director here at uh, NIDIA did a lot of work on, Professor Natalie Jackson, was on um, the, the sort of Māori and Pacific, what she called the collateral demographic dividend. And very simply, it's a sort of a result of we have got a very rapidly ageing Pākehā population um, and in some, you know, some regions moving out of the labour force, much greater numbers are moving into the labour force. At the same time, we've got a very structurally youthful Māori and Pacific population, but of course have been heavily underinvested in. Um, and so, but really, you know, our future labour force, particularly in a context of very uncertain migration levels, is going to depend more and more on, um, you know, investing in a timely and significant way in our youthful Māori and Pacific population to ensure that these rangatahi can participate equitably in the labour force because increasingly they're going to make up a more important significant part of the sort of Aotearoa economic engine room, if you like. You know, and that hasn't really been appreciated in, in the most part because Māori and Pacific rangatahi tend to be seen as a burden, as a deficit, rather than as a future resource. And so there's been this sort of myopic short-term sort of approach to making the most of what we have at home, which is our people. So what sort of um, interventions or policies could you take to address this you know, relatively young population as a resource that's going to you know, improve well-being, productivity for the entire economy? Yeah, well, I think first of all it's this kind of framing, but such a sort of an individualised deficit disadvantaged sort of narrative, you know, we still see everywhere on the daily. And I just think just turning turning that narrative around is hugely important. Um, there's places where that's happening, of course. Um, there's some really, really innovative work that's coming out of places like Tukuna Taraki and Naitahu, where they're focused very intentionally. So they're taking the demography very seriously and they're focused very intentionally on creating successful transitions from secondary school into training, into tertiary, into the employment market. And it's getting alongside, it's working with Fano, it's framing it in a way that's going to resonate, it's going to have meaning. And so really what that means is not just, um, you know, not just local communities getting on board, but actually significant um, government investment in what works. And increasingly what we're seeing is what works is by Māori, for Māori, lead solutions. And, and just uh, finally, Germany, for example, uh, has had a stated policy of bringing in lots of migrants to you know, invigorate an ageing society. And I don't think any politicians or policymakers have actively said that here. How could we do it differently so that we were focused a lot more on our local resources? So maybe we need to stop fixating on population growth as a panacea to the economy. Maybe we need to start adjusting ourselves to what is inevitably going to be the end of population growth by the end of the century globally. Maybe we need to get a head start on this and start thinking creatively and differently about what our population here in Aotearoa might look like. Stop relying on migration as some sort of magical fix it. It's not.
Um, That's the problem, though, yeah, isn't it? It's a, it it's is. a political economy problem where the it politicians is. reach for the short-term lever of bringing the migrants to pump up the um, income tax and GST revenues, but not invest in the infrastructure to deal with them. Luckily, yes. of course, the lack of infrastructure to cope with all the people coming in pushes up house prices, which makes you more popular. And you end up with this lack of uh, any sort of controls on the politicians using that short-term lever and maybe having some sort of uh, policy framework which is agreed across parliament or independent of the political processes. One way to just take their hands off that lever. Oh, look, you know, I don't disagree. And I do think, I don't think it's kind of like a, maybe a one-size-fits-all sort of population policy. Maybe it's a sort of a coordinated, and I think it would have to be a coordinated approach across a range of policies rather than sort of a magic population policy. And also, you know, there's also a bit of an allergic reaction. You mentioned population policy and people automatically think that you're going to somehow try and meddle with their fertility or, or, or you know, or, or, put, or, or put really sort of draconian measures in place around migration. So, you know, at least I think, you know, if you want, a great degree of transparency on the part of politicians and having a framework that sits across a whole range of policy settings is probably the way to go. But again, you know, I can't emphasise this enough. I think it has to be more than settling on an arbitrary number. And I think there always is a real temptation to sort of settle upon a nice arbitrary round number um, and not a lot of thought has gone into it and then that really deflects from other issues around composition, around growth, around regional divergence, around the very different needs that different regions have, around population inequities and how that's overlaid with ethnicity, which is huge here in Aotearoa. So there's a population approach to uh, policy moving ahead then I think that would have to be kind of probably more nuanced than what politicians are currently thinking of. Kia ora, Professor Tahu Kukutai at Waikato University. Thank you very much. And after the break, we'll speak to Jeff Cooper, who is the General Manager of Strategy at the newly formed Infrastructure Commission, all about trying to plan how much infrastructure we need for the population we have. When the Facts Change is brought to you in partnership with KiwiBank to help you understand the issues affecting the economy. And that's what their team of experts is here to do too. Here's KiwiBank's Chief Economist, Jared Kerr, and what's happening with inflation in 2024? Globally, inflation rose to really high levels. We saw inflation averaging over 10% uh, last year. Now central banks have reacted. They, they've tightened monetary policy. They've lifted interest rates to levels where it hurts. We've seen growth slow down and we're seeing inflation coming off, which is great news because we import a lot of inflation from the rest of the world and that imported inflation is easing. So half the job that we're trying to do locally is is being done for us offshore. The other half, the domestic bit, well, that's the tough bit. That's the sticky inflation that's coming out of our housing market, it's coming out of construction, it's coming out of service industries, then it's going to be hard to contain. Visit kiwibank.co.nz to stay up to date with detailed economic analysis and forecasts from Jared and other KiwiBank experts. They take big issues from both here and overseas and make them relevant to Kiwi businesses. Raising capital or taking your business to the world? Investment Fix has the lowdown on everything you need to make it happen. This season, we're exploring the US market, the opportunities it offers, what it takes to grow a business there, and the best way to approach investors. Join some of the superstars of the investment and business world as they share advice from their time in the US so you can make your mahi count in this massive market. The Investment Fix Podcast, brought to you by Invest New Zealand. Tune in today. Skinny are helping you show how smart you are with the 1Q Quiz, an all-new, super-challenging and super-quick daily quiz built by The Spin-Off. Every Monday, Skinny are giving you the chance to prove you're smart with the Skinny Extra Credit question. Get it right, and you'll get the chance to score yourself some Skinny Extra mobile credit so you can text, call, or even video call your group chat and gloat about how big your brain is. T's and C's apply. Well, kia ora to Jeff Cooper from the Infrastructure Commission. Welcome to When the Facts Change from your home office somewhere out in the world. <laughs> Kia ora, Bernard. Thank you for having me. Yeah, day day one of uh, lockdown. I hope it's not too long. Yes, um, we all do. I'm sitting on my bed having refused to buy a desk in the assumption that if I bought a desk, it would bring on a lockdown and that didn't work. So, so um, 
Could you tell us how the Infrastructure Commission thinks about population growth when it's doing its plans, forecasts, um, giving its advice? Yeah, we sure can. I mean, there's a few elements to um, population growth that are obviously central to, to infrastructure. Um, and it's, of course, not just the rate of growth that we're thinking about for New Zealand, but, of course, where that growth is going because um, infrastructure fundamentally is, is a spatial thing, right? We put things in location. So we, we want to know not just... Um, uh, how many people there are in New Zealand, but where those those people are located. And the reason why we're interested in that is that that sort of demand side is uh, what establishes the case for infrastructure in the first place, right? So it is this sort of increase in population, which is generating a demand for the services that infrastructure can provide. Yeah. So which forecasts do you do you use? Do you make up your own mm. or is there someone else's you just copy and paste? I, I mean, we, we pay a lot of attention to the Statistics New Zealand population projections. And certainly if you look back over time, if you track the projections that we've seen from, from institutions like Statistics New Zealand against uh, what has happened in practice, there's, there's a large variance, right? Um, and what's interesting about this, we sort of live in a world where uh, we're quite used to seeing these projections undershoot what we see in reality. Um, but there has, of course, been a time when uh, when the opposite was the case, where we were uh, over-projecting. So we, we've undershot at times and overshot at other times. And what that tells us is that uh, medium projections are something we should look at, but not necessarily, um, um, you know, put everything on. So why have we been so bad at um, building enough infrastructure, particularly over the last 10 years, but you could argue over the last 30 years. Was there some sort of structural change in the way that New Zealanders, the government, local government thought or funded or planned for infrastructure? Yeah, what is clear about the, the evolution and the growth path of our cities is that we seem to be losing a lot of the benefits of larger cities and larger places quite early on in their development, right? When you think about um, a place like, like Auckland where it gets to, you know, 1.7 million people, it becomes very difficult to believe that we can build the infrastructure that can get people in from now very far-flung places of Auckland into the areas of high-paying jobs and a congestion-free network, and that that's going to be affordable. Um, and but, so that's on you know that's for a city of 1.7. But even if you go to a, a city like Tauranga, um, which has far fewer um, people than that, and has somehow managed to find its way into being, you know, uh, in the top handful of most expensive uh, places to live in the world. Um, it is growing in a way that its infrastructure costs are, are seem to be very high. Um, and that one reason for that is, of course, the land use patterns that we choose for our cities. They tend to sprawl quite a lot. We tend to have a high reliance on things like single dwelling housing, which is very land intensive, and we tend to grow more horizontal than vertical. Now, infrastructure tends to support density more easily than it does disperse patterns of growth. That's why we see more infrastructure in urban places than we do in, in uh, rural places, right? But even thinking about the, the nature of cities themselves, growing out makes it more difficult to service patterns of urbanisation in those dispersed patterns. Is there a political economy problem here where both central and local government like to give tax cuts to um, voters or keep rates increases low? How do you, you know, plan for infrastructure that's efficient, make sure that we have enough of it, when you could argue the institutional bias in our governments is to not build infrastructure at all? Yeah, what you're getting at there is are there political economy questions to the where of cities? Um, and it is undoubtedly the case that there is, right? I mean, having worked for for Auckland Council and having lived through the unitary plan, lived through the national policy statement on urban development, I've been in those community meetings, um, it's undeniable that there's a, a political economy um, at play here. And of course, the system's designed for that in many ways. I mean, that's why we have local consultation, right? So um, the wear of infrastructure clearly has a political um, element to it. 
Um, and that and the risk that we face w- with respect to, to the where is that we end up building things in places that are second best, right? We put people in places where there's a little bit more congestion that they have to face. It's a little bit more difficult to get to the nice areas, whether that's the coastal areas or the beaches or the employment places that pay the highest wages and incrementally over time by placing things in second best positions the whole time we end up with cities that are um, exceedingly unaffordable have high rates of congestion have crowding issues all of these sorts of issues which which seem kind of um, ubiquitous across New Zealand cities. Because in the last 10 years, um, we had significant amounts of uh, temporary migration uh, that increased our population faster than we had expected. Would we be better off having a a much broader, longer-term plan or or agreement on ranges of what we really expected population to do, given that there seems to be a willingness to try and control our migrant settings. Surely there needs to be a population policy to, you know, line up with whatever we're doing on infrastructure. Yeah, so if I just sort of take the infrastructure angle of this, every infrastructure project, um, certainly the long ones, the intergenerational ones, are an exercise in understanding future demand, right? And a lot of that comes from population growth. So the uncertainty that we see in in population growth, and we know that exists, um, uh, that that creates uncertainty in in the infrastructure that we provide and the choices that we make with respect to infrastructure. Um, so you know, would a would a plan help reduce that uncertainty? It, it certainly could. Certainly, trying to create some more certainty would would help um, infrastructure provision. I think, um, especially with some of those long term projects. Um, I, I just also sort of make the point here, I guess, that, um, you know, there's plenty to gain from population growth. I mean, I've, I've worked in places like Detroit that have experienced um, population stagnation or population decline. Uh, the challenges that they face are more difficult uh, than the challenges, of, and, and let me say, far less exciting <laughs> than the challenges associated with population growth. The housing is very cheap, and it's cheap for a good reason. The wages are very low. Right, and um, the access to amenity is very low, um, and so uh, you would expect them to, to be cheap. But of course, when you're going to places that have high population growth, that have a, a reason why people are wanting to move there, um, that's creating more opportunities in the labour markets. It's creating more opportunities to learn from people. It's generating higher wages. If you can attract those highly talented people into a country, uh, that's what that is one source of productivity gain. What we're struggling with in, in New Zealand seems to be that, um, you know, not necessarily that we're not attracting those people, although that we may not be attracting enough of them, but that as we are attracting people into New Zealand, these, these downsides of population growth, the congestion, the infrastructure cross, costs, the crowding, for some reason, they seem to, to bite really hard, right? And the question to us is why is it that that is occurring in New Zealand cities uh, in a way that didn't seem to occur uh, in other global cities when they were at populations of one to two million people? Isn't it because, as the Infrastructure Commission has said, there's a $75 billion infrastructure deficit and governments and um, councils have gone out of their way over the last 30 years not to invest in infrastructure so they could keep taxes low and... Uh, avoid rates increases and try to lump the new costs of new infrastructure onto uh, individual users and people at the fringes. And surprisingly, those people didn't want to pay for it, so it wasn't built. Yeah, I mean, I, th- I certainly think that we haven't um, we haven't invested enough in infrastructure services, right? <clears throat> um, I, I would just make the point though that it's actually not always about building new things. Um, that in many cases we're actually just not making the best use of the assets that we already have around us, right? Um, So I would uh, point to something like um, congestion in Auckland where you see that, um, you know, we have these two massive peaks in the morning and the uh, AM and PM peak um, and uh, low use outside of those peaks that we're not really pricing these um, uh, uh, this infrastructure in a way that makes the best use of it. Um, so it's not all about building new assets. And, and the other thing, of course, when you think about 
maybe, you know, could we make better use of land in areas that's already close to the CBD, right? That in areas that actually wouldn't need that much more additional, certainly not much more additional transportation infrastructure, right? Which is the expensive one. That is a, a really important non-built solution to the infrastructure problem. So, it, you know, the $75 billion number um, for the infrastructure deficit, there's a number of ways to cut it up. Um, and it's not all about new funding. So what would your advice to anyone thinking about um, migration uh, policy and about population policy be from an infrastructure commission point of view? So, you know, I would sort of pose this question of how big do we think our cities are going to get? Not today or tomorrow, but in 100 or 200 years. How big do we think Auckland will peak at its maximum? Or how big will Tauranga or Wellington peak at its maximum? And then let's start building plans, uh, not necessarily infrastructure, but plans around, uh, around that, rather than trying to do this in an incremental way, which can lead to poor, poor outcomes, both for the residents of, of these urban places, um, but also infrastructure outcomes as well. Because in a way, it's an intergenerational wealth decision that you make which you can uh, handle by, you know, uh, borrowing money to invest and then spread the cost out over a long period of time. But um, when we have a structural rule in the guts of our government that says the government should always look to reduce its debt, uh, is it actually possible to do that um, spreading the costs over many generations? Well, I mean, infrastructure is unique in this um, respect, right? Because you're, build, you're building something today that is going to benefit um, many people in, into the future. And so if you kind of look at this from an intergenerational equity perspective, the case for debt is really strong, right? I mean, it, it, you know, you should use debt when you're trying to sp spread costs across generations. When we're thinking about reducing debt um, in government, I don't want to mix that up with decisions about infrastructure, which are fundamentally making investments that last for a very, very long time. But is there a, you know, a fault in the machine, if you like? The Public Finance Act makes it very clear the entire aim of government is to reduce debt in normal times. I mean, but much of infrastructure, of course, is delivered by local governments, of course, right? Yes, and, but in a way, they're restricted by that same rule because they don't have the funding tools at the moment to to pay the interest costs over the long run. I mean, I, mean, I actually, I, I, I'd sort of challenge that a little bit. I think that the funding tools, um, local governments have access to a great number of funding tools. Um, now, whether or not they get used is a different question, right? And that's when we start running into some of the political economy questions. Um, and we sort of get stuck in this space of saying, well, the tools are available that they don't want to use them. And so, you know, you sort of have two two choices here. Either you either you think about changing those political economy incentives, right, so that we have institutions that are incentivized to grow in the first place, or you kind of step on top of the political economy of, of problems and you just sort of fund the infrastructure. And that's when you run into the issue you've just spoken about. So you're trying to sort of optimise in two difficult uh, locations. There's no easy answers. Yeah. No, that's, um, that's a fascinating way to look at it. Uh, Jeff Cooper, thank you very much from the Infrastructure Commission, the General Manager of Strategy, and lovely to talk about population. Great. Thanks, Ben. Appreciate it. And now we talk to Francis Collins, who is a geographer and a researcher on migration, particularly temporary migration, at Waikato University. Francis, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Bernard. It's really nice to be here. Tell us about how temporary migration in New Zealand has changed over the last decade or so, and maybe how people might have missed this big, big change, because typically we'd focus on the number of residencies handed out, when actually the number of people with temporary work visas or other visas with work rights has been changing quite rapidly. Yes, you're right, um, Bernard, over the last decade, but actually the last two decades has been a really, really big increase in the number of people gaining work visas and student visas to live in New Zealand. And some of those people do become permanent residents, um, but a very large proportion of people actually remain on work and study visas for, you know, can be for quite a considerable number of years. To kind of give you a, a ballpark sense of that, the end of the 1990s, there were around 30,000 people entering New Zealand on a work visa. By the time we get to the um, 
late 2010, so 2019, 2020, uh, that, that number had jumped to around 240,000. That's just work visas alone. Over that same time period, permanent residence visas, so the number of people granted residence visas had, had stayed relatively stagnant and it had actually declined in the years prior to, um, prior to 2020. Could you give us a flavour of um, what sort of things uh, those people are doing, where they're living, where they might have come from, how long they've been here? Well, I mean, there's a huge amount of variation, right? So, but if we thought about some some of the big groups of temporary migrants, we'd say, well, there's a lot of people here who are international students. Then you'd say, well, actually, there's a very large number of people on work visas. So there's certain kinds of occupations like hospitality, uh, the accommodation sector, farming, dairy farming in particular, um, construction work, care work, um, where there's actually substantial numbers of people um, working in those occupations who are on various kinds of work visas. They're probably going to have partners with them. Some of them are allowed to have partners with them. Some of them are not. It depends on the work visa they're on, whether they're allowed to have their families with them. Particularly um, those ones who have uh, rolled their visas again and again and started to put uh, roots down into communities. They may have found partners or had kids or joined clubs or joined churches. How does that change the flavour of the community when you have quite a few people here, as you say, 6% overall, but quite a few people who are sort of in limbo. They're sort of second-class citizens in a way. They don't have the same rights as everyone else and in some cases now have to be very worried about whether they get rolled again. Yeah, so, so there has been a pattern of people on work visas, well, student visas and work visas sort of being here on work for, for a continu- continuous period of time. And one of, the, one of the elements of work visas in particular, especially for people on, in jobs that are considered low skilled, is that you're right, they don't have um, the ability to plan long term. So most work visas for people on low skilled, in low skilled work, and that might include people in the construction sector, care work, farming, those kinds of occupations, possibly transport and logistics, um, they might get a one year work visa. And they, in the current system, they can renew that two times and they can be here for three years. They may or may not be able to have their family with them. They can't access housing, health care or education for their children if their children are here. So in effect, they, they become put aside from the rest of society yeah, as, as a population who are deemed only to be here for work purposes. And I do think that has a detrimental effect. Obviously, for those individuals, that's quite clear. Um, but I would say it has a detrimental effect for society as a whole. Um, because you get a population of people who aren't actually able to be included and aren't actually able to participate fully in society. And I think most people would agree that we you, you want people to be able to participate in society, to have a prosperous society, to have a cohesive society, to have one that's, um, um, that's socially just as well. Can you give us a flavour of um, how it's changed the fabric of uh, some communities and, you know, some of the on-the-ground effects of, you know, having people who, you know, are in New Zealand but aren't New Zealanders? Um, you have to look at specific places. I've done a little bit of research in Invercargill and Queenstown in recent years, and one of the things that you see there, and that particularly, let's say, in a place like Invercargill, is that you've had a city that um, for a few decades had experienced some population decline. That pattern turned around in the last 10 or 20 years, partly to do with temporary migration. And you know, for people in in Chicago, for city leaders um, and for community leaders and for other people there, they might say, well, this is actually a really good thing. The population's turning around. There might be more kids in school. Uh, there might be uh, more people, you know, shopping in restaurants and at um, shops locally and, you know, all those sorts of things. There might be some increased demand on housing as well. But what, of course, you then find is that people being on temporary visas means that actually those populations don't remain in that place. And so it's actually very hard for um, local organisations to plan for um, future populations. There can't be any certainty about whether those migrants will be able to stay. So, you know, you get to a place like that, and yes, population's turned around a bit in terms of its trajectory, and people will see some good in that, but actually it's very difficult to see that as a long-term gain because it's just not, it's just so reliant on what the government chooses to do in, overall in terms of migration policy. How did we get to this point? It seems almost sort of accidentally on purpose we found ourselves with a massive change in, um, in the flows of people coming into New Zealand. Six percent's not a small number for any population. You know, um, did anyone plan this or think about it? Or did it just sort of happen and, oh, gee, where did they come from? Um, I think there are, there are some very specific causes of the current situation around temporary migration or current approach to it. And I'd, I'd probably focus in on two things. 
Uh, firstly, um, you could recognise that a large part of the temporary migrant population have been international students. And so that's been tied up with um, governments in New Zealand seeking to use education as a export industry. Right? So we encourage uh, universities, private training establishments, schools and others um, to promote their services internationally for full cost fees so that they can fund their institutions and attract students for that purpose. The other reason why we have a substantial temporary migrant population now is that um, in that period of the early 2000s, um, a Labour government, Leanne Dalziel in particular as an immigration minister, focused a lot on shifting the emphasis from recruiting people for residence offshore, that is saying, identifying people because they had a university degree and saying, you should come here and we'll give you residence and then you stay, to a system whereby we tested people out. Right? So we encourage people to come to New Zealand, get job experience, get work experience, then apply for a residence visa. That created the need for lots of work visas for people to come in and do that. And over time, the existence of those work visas, and this is the accidental bit, became much more predominant than the residence visas themselves. And so we've got to a situation now where work visas are real, you know, high volume labor migration has really been the, the major part of the migration system in the last 10 years. So the government is now doing a review of uh, migration settings and has frozen all sorts of processing of uh, expressions of interest for residency and uh, bringing partners over, but it has said that it's not planning to do a population policy. And the question for the government is, how can you really do any sort of planning on your infrastructure or meet your treaty obligations or properly understand how to deal with climate change if you haven't got an idea of what your population is going to be. It would be complicated to calculate what the, what an appropriate figure would be, and it would and it would rely on um, some pretty sophisticated understanding of labour market needs, given that that's where most temporary migration has been focused. It would also rely on, um, I guess, a, some agreement with educational institutions, given the significance of international students within that sector. So a sense that there's a certain number of international students within universities that is or isn't appropriate. Um, so you could do that. It'd be, it'd be pretty complicated. What you wouldn't want is a blunt figure that was nationwide. I think that could that would be quite problematic uh, because, again, go, go back to the example of Invercargill. Right? So we have a blunt figure, for example, for the whole of New Zealand and say we should only have this many people. Well, what does that mean for a city like Invercargill that's had population decline, a little bit of pop modest growth in recent years, but not actually overwhelming growth via, via migration, does that mean that you know they then return to a process of population decline because we're capping the number of people migrating to New Zealand? So I think some care is needed in terms of thinking about the, the, the different needs of different parts of New Zealand. For me as well in the temporary migration space, I'd prob probably also say that the focus on, on controlling migration has often been to restrict the rights of migrants themselves and often to reduce their work visa length or re reduce their access to the ability to have family um, and reducing visa length reduces access to healthcare and various other sorts of things. For me, rather than thinking about a specific number, and I, I, I do recognise it could be valuable to think about a number, it actually is quite important to think about those rights and actually, I would, I would be thinking about a migration policy that's focused on encouraging stability of migrant populations rather than the very high levels of churn. That situation, I don't think, is desirable. And it's, again, go back to that point about smaller settlements and using how do they plan? How does a local government plan for a temporary migrant population or maybe one that might become permanent over time if those populations are coming and going all the time and changing jobs all the time because their work visas make it really hard? to stay in a stable role in a stable place and build a family, become part of a community and so on and so forth. Francis Collins, thank you very much from Waikato University. Ka kite anō. And thank you there to Francis Collins, to Tahu Kukutai and to Paul Spoonley, along with Jeff Cooper at the Infrastructure Commission. I'm Bernard Hickey. That was When the Facts Change, a podcast from the Spinoff Podcast Network, brought to you in partnership with Kiwi Bank. And don't forget, it's a weekly podcast, so you need to hit the subscribe button to make sure it ends up in your devices every week. When the Facts Change was brought to you by the Spinoff Podcast Network, together with Kiwi Bank. Visit kiwibank.co.nz to find out how Kiwi Bank are making Kiwi better off. <laughs>
Are you making the most of your KiwiSaver investment? Generate is an award-winning KiwiSaver provider with a track record of strong long-term performance. Making a smart decision now could add tens of thousands of dollars by the time you reach retirement. Book a no-obligation chat with a Generate KiwiSaver advisor today at generatekiwisaver.co.nz slash advice. A copy of the product disclosure statement is available at generatekiwisaver.co.nz. The issuer of the scheme is Generate Investment Management Limited and of course past performance does not guarantee future returns. The Spin-Off Podcast Network.